Let's, let's have a prayer together. Gracious God, we're grateful for the opportunity to live in such a beautiful place as Teleco Village. Lord, we ask your blessings upon our community, all the residents that live here and comprise this uh, wonderful place. We ask your blessings upon this gathering and that we would be able to uh, more effectively manage the homes that we have here in our community and make it a place that others want to come to. Lord, we're grateful for all you do for us, and today we ask this prayer in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Um, so just as a reminder, today's meeting is being recorded and streamed live. In maybe about a week, you'll be able to watch it on hoatv.org. And you can watch it uh, effective immediately on telecochurch.com. So we've got a very brief update about HOA, a very special surprise joint presentation by Bruce and myself, an update from Winston on a lot of the hot topics of interest to everybody, an update from our representative, Lowell Russell, and thank you for all you do for Teleco Village. Uh, Melissa Lindquist is going to give us an overview of TVA flood and river management. Ken and Ken are going to do part two on cybersecurity. And then Keith is going to educate us a little bit on the Monroe County Friends of Animals. So as you've heard me say before, but we're very proud that HOA has been around for 30 years, and this is the 30th anniversary year. So we've got some fun things planned for a June 20th different general meeting. You'll get to meet some of the village pioneers, hear a little bit about our history, and we have a couple surprises uh, planned for you. And on August 8th, there's dinner, music, and dancing at the Yacht Club. So please uh, come and join us for both of those. So just a reminder on a few things. HOA socials now start at 4.30, so we can pack in everything we're trying to accomplish, and they're still the second Tuesday of every month. We're working on a three-time-a-month HOA email to make it easier for you to find information and the dates you're looking for, and we're going to get that out to you in the next several weeks. There's a new Highway Safety Committee that's been meeting with TDOT and other organizations. They picked up where the TDOT committee, who got us some of those enhancements on 444, left off. So you'll find an update soon on the intersection of 11 and 321, which I know is a point of interest for many of us driving that way. So in the next couple days, you'll see some information on that on the HOA website. Also, I can't believe it's already May, but we're always looking for a couple good volunteers for uh, HOA. You're going to see some things on the website shortly, but if you've got an interest in working with a fun group of people, uh, don't hesitate to find anybody and let us know, please. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, do you want to join me for this special recognition and maybe explain a little bit about it, please? Hundreds of years ago, when I was senior in high school, I took a life-saving course um, and part of that 
would be required to learn how to do CPR. Um, not only me, but hundreds and thousands of people across the country have also taken that course. And over the years, hundreds of thousands of lives have been so, uh, saved by a process called CPR. What we've learned in, in recent years is that there's another thing that's happening, another action that we can take that will save probably just as many lives. And that's a thing called stop the bleed. With all of the um, terrorist activities that we have, all the school shootings, when you go to a mall, you don't know if you're there now to shop or to be shot. So we do know that, that there's a lot that's happening. And we've found over time, talking about people across the country, we found that we're losing just as many people bleeding to death as it seems that we lose through heart attacks. Consequently, um, smart people in this country got together and formed a program called Stop the Bleed. And that's basically where you go about shutting down uh, blood coming into a, a wound uh, in such a way that you can save a person's life. Um, the fire department here in the village um, have trained some of the volunteer firefighters to be the lead for the Stop the Bleed program. You'll be seeing a lot of that and you'll be invited to participate. And if I could advise any of you to do anything that could probably save your life as well as your family and loved ones and friends would be to enroll in a CPR class and likewise to enroll in a Stop the Bleed. Today, we're going to recognize several of the people here in the village that took immediate action and saved the life of one of our fellow um, villagers. I'd like to read, if you haven't read it already, there was a, a letter of commendation that was uh, drafted and, and written by uh, one of our uh, deputy uh, in the fire department. And I'd like to read that to you because we had an event, as I said, that happened, quick action saved a life. On April 9th, 2019, approximately 4.30, Toko Village Fire Department um, advanced emergency medical technician, Gene DeSanto, and fellow medical first responders, Alan Abney, Daniel Hanley, and Joseph Bill, responded to a 911 dispatch call regarding a traumatic injury over on Okamuli Circle. Probably said that wrong. Upon arrival, the responders found that Mr. Pat Soule, he was on his deck with a severe laceration to his leg caused by a reciprocating saw. His wife, Sandra Soule, was applying pressure to the wound in order to staunch the substantial bleeding. The responders assessed the injury and found it to be a severe artery, a severed artery, which was spurting copious amounts of blood. The responders, recognizing the life-threatening implications of this wound, quickly applied pressure, pressure dressings, and a tourniquet to Mr. Soule's wound. Priority Ambulance Medic 22 arrived and added a second tourniquet. Mr. Soul was transported to UT Medical Center. Later that night, at a fire call, Priority Ambulance Medical 22 crew approached our chief, Jerry Dockery, and stated that the quick and appropriate action taken by the above responders and his wife saved Mr. Soul's life. On May 4th, at the TV VFD open house, Mr. Soul walked in to the fire station and presented a letter of commendation to Fire Chief Jerry Dari. Mr. Soule credited the responders, ambulance crew, and the UTMC personnel with saving his life. He stated he was told he had lost two liters of blood. He underwent four surgeries and spent numerous days in a re rehabilitation center. Mr. Soule graciously granted permission of the TV BFD to disclose his identity and the circumstances of his injury. 
AEMT DeSanto, and EMRs Abney, Hanley, and Bill are commended for their quick and appropriate actions and their medical expertise, which contributed to saving the life of Mr. So. Having seen that and read that and talked to the chief, I felt like uh, these are some actions that need to be recognized in the community and that uh, these are the kinds of people in the village that give of their time and take quick actions and save lives. So I asked the board how we could do this. We thought it would be a great idea to do a joint venture with the HOA because I know like us, the POA, the HOA is very interested in recognizing actions such as these. So today, uh, Ellen and I would like to present to the four fire department personnel along with Ms. Sandra Soule to come forward and receive humanitarian awards issued to them by the POA and the HOA. So I'll read the plaque and if you will come forward, I'd appreciate it. First is uh, Ms. Sandra Soule. Would you come forward, please? It says the certificate says on April 9th, 2019, Sandra Soule and the TV VFD personnel swiftly and effectively applied stop the bleed procedures to a family member who had cut his femoral artery. These actions saved a life. Sandra's efforts reflect greatly upon herself and the greater community. You want a picture? Yes. Next up is Jean Santo De Santo. Jean. Certificate reads basically the same. On April 9, 2019, Mr. Gene DeSanto and his TV VFD partners swiftly and effectively applied stop the bleed procedures to a fellow villager who had cut his femoral artery. These actions saved a life. Gene's efforts reflect greatly upon himself, the Telco Village Fire Department, and the greater community. Next is Alan Abney. Alan. <laughs> Basically says the same thing. So. There's a theme. There's a theme. So I knew shortly after we moved here that we lived in a pretty magical place called Teleco Village and that the fire department was a pretty special part of that. 
But this is really remarkably extraordinary, what you guys did. And I just really want to thank you and a great idea to recognize extraordinary events like this. Thank you on behalf of all of us. I would be remiss if I did not recognize the man of the hour, Mr. Pat Soule. Pat? No. Um, you, you want to introduce okay. Winston or do I? Um, either one. You can introduce him. Okay. Uh, I was asked to introduce the next speaker, and the next speaker is a fellow that I've been working with for the last three and a half years. Uh, I meet with him, seems like, almost on a daily basis. <laughs> and um, without further ado, Mr. Winston Blazer is going to come up and give you a little update of what's going on in the village. Thank you, Bruce. I'm Winston Blazer, general manager of the uh, Tunico Village Property Owners Association, and I'm going to cover about six topics, update you on what's going on there in the village. Got three major projects. Let's see. Three major projects going on this year. This is a very ambitious year for us. Uh, Kahiti Community Center, the Toka Clubhouse, and Wellness Center, the uh, large HVAC unit that's in the pool area, and then also the roof is going to be redone, re-looked at. And uh, those are keeping Mr. Gagley very busy. Uh, the Kahiti Community Center <clears throat> it's got it shingled in now it's all under roof um, it's uh, coming along nicely some of the things that I like about it is uh, that's a picture of the HVAC and the electrical rough end the front uh, uh, cover the architecture blends in nicely with the original building but what I really like about it is the way it's tied in I was over there last week and looking at that and the shingles and the architecture and all that, it's going to look, in a year's time, it's going to look like it's all built as one big building. And so it's coming together nicely. Jeff, you're doing a good job supervising that over there. I've yet to see you do any work over there, but uh, anyway, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. The other project's the Topa Clubhouse. I <clears throat> uh, wanted to cover something here on this uh, point. I've heard some comments about the building didn't seem to be much larger than the old building, uh, so forth and so on. So I put some data up here. The old clubhouse was uh, 3,600 square feet. Uh, the new one's going to be a lot larger than that, uh, about uh, double the size, 6,800, 6,900 feet. The old building, uh, if we just crammed it full, would hold about 50 property owners in there for a dinner event. Uh, this one's going to hold uh, approximately 100 and the outdoor seating is probably another 30 to 40, maybe 50 uh, additional seats outside designed for that. It's going to be covered. So it's going to be much more advantageous than uh, even the uh, Tennessee Clubhouse. Here I, I took the uh, old footprint of the old building and the new footprint to kind of give you a comparison for those that don't like to do numbers and look at it that way. You can clearly see the old building versus the new footprint is uh, the, old, the oldest could be consumed in that building almost double. So the, the old building, uh, let's just put that to rest. This is a much bigger facility. It's going to be very nice. Here is uh, Jeff not putting up the trusses for the building. Uh, they're up now. The uh, roof is, is uh, sheeted in. Uh, I think they probably completed that today. Uh, next week, Jeff assures me that the uh, felt, the, what I used to refer to as tar paper, will be put down. And then about three weeks, the metal roof will go on and it'll be completely in the dry. And uh, from that point, they'll be able to uh, really boom and go on the uh, interior work. The last project is uh, the HVAC. When Simon came on board, he pointed out to us that we had some severe issues with humidity and temperature and, and uh, temperature of the air and temperature of the water. Now, I don't want to get into pool temperature discussion. That's, that's a dead issue. But uh, 
he pointed out we had some issues and it turned out that the HVAC unit in there was uh, worn out and maybe a little undersized and it had to be fixed because of the damage it was doing to the structure. Uh, that was addressed this year. Uh, a new HVA system was put in. It's called a Dectron unit. Basically, it's a, just a giant uh, HVAC unit that handles the temperature and the humidity levels of that facility. And so now we have got that under control. Everything is operating as normal. And uh, the next part now is to, uh, and, and along with that, the structure was tested to make sure that we didn't have any other underlying issues. And uh, we are now moving on to the roof. Uh, the roofing, uh, they're, they're going to send that out for bids, I think, in the next couple of weeks. And then uh, depending on the board's decision, whether it's a shingle roof or a metal roof, I think the board has to, they want to discuss that because a metal roof is going to be of a lot longer durability. Depending on which one they go with will depend on the timing of when that's applied. So that, that project is moving right along. Another topic I want to talk about was the various studies that we've got going on. Uh, this year is a year of uh, not only projects, but we've got a lot of uh, uh, high-level studies going on. The roads are being looked at. Uh, Mr. Gagley and his PSAC crew in the engineering firm is uh, looking at that. Uh, the report is in progress, probably going to be wrapped up in the latter part or middle part of June, somewhere in there, and then it'll be shared with PSAC and uh, then eventually come to the board. The sewer study, <clears throat> that has been shared with the board and the PSAC. I think they just got that a couple of days ago. And basically, they're taking a look at our sewer infrastructure, comparing it, with, I mean, uh, studying it with its, uh, uh, the growth patterns of the village and its capability to make sure that we've got plenty of room for growth and uh, the uh, study is complete and in their hands. And uh, my preliminary review of that, everything looked pretty good. And then there was a reserve study. Uh, this was a board goal uh, shepherded by uh, Steve Snyder. Uh, he wanted me to emphasize that this goal is going to turn out to be a couple of year, maybe three year project. Uh, we're looking at our reserves. When I say reserve study, we're looking at our reserve balances and we're looking at all the projects and all the maintenance that's going to take place in the years coming. And one of the things that we did recognize is we want to do a longer study. We do a, a budget and then a five year plan. We're going to take that out 10, maybe 15 years and look at all of that that is going to take place, things that we know we're going to have to do, like road work, and then dreams that we have in the future. And we're going to take that and, and look at that process to make sure that we have all of that covered. Uh, so when you take all of these studies, the road study, the sewer study, uh, the um, reserve study, all of that will be baked into the financial process. And all of this will be incorporated, everything that we learn. And also on top of that, the long-range planning is doing a study. And when they conclude with that study, the projects and the directional information that they give us, all of that's going to be baked into our financial plan. And uh, it will be a, 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 you know, a, a pretty thorough look by all of these groups. And then it'll be a pretty thorough look once it's all put together. So you should feel pretty comfortable. I feel good about our, our financial status anyway, but I'm sure by the time Parker and Kevin get through with it and the accounting staff and the finance committee and the board and then all the individual committees, uh, which I, I won't name them all right now, by the time all of that's reviewed done, we're going to be in pretty good shape, which we, we already are. Another thing I wanted to comment on is the ACC. The blue book is being reviewed, but uh, first off, I just want to give you this little morsel of data. Through April, the ACC department had permitted 53 homes, and we thought 2018 was good. Uh, that's five more than through the same time period last year. So this year is even better than last year's so far. So anyway, things are booming there. But the ACC is looking at the blue book. They're looking at the guidelines and the requirements to make sure that they're cohesive. As we grow, things have to change. They have to modify. We have to relook at things. We can't do things the way we did 10, 15 years ago because it just doesn't apply. So they're updating the guidelines to make sure the rules are pertinent to the, today's environment. And they're also considering an addendum for environmental consideration and environmental guidance. So that's, that's going to be new ground for us. And I'm sure that that kind of makes our attorney very nervous. 
and maybe some of the ACC members nervous, but I think it's good that they take a look at those and uh, go from there. Also new for this year, I don't know how many golfers I got in the room, but I wish all of you would play more golf, please. Uh, Pat, if they'd give me time, I'd let you come up and do your sermon on golf and how that helps us. But anyway, we got a lot of new programs. We got a Palmer Cup named after one of our longtime employees that works at the uh, Tenacity Clubhouse. That's a, a tournament that's uh, more based on their formal PGA type approach. Major Par 3, we have a little Par 3 tournament that is uh, run in conjunction with the majors. Uh, it's a very fun tournament. Uh, one that I want to kind of cover in depth is the chip, putt, suds, and strings. I don't need to explain those words to you. You really don't have to chip, but you can putt if you want to. But the suds and the strings, food, beverage, music, and it's for non-golfers. It's a lot of fun, and it might be a way to introduce you to some of the uh, activities at the golf course. And we're trying to expand our horizon in that area. It's uh, one, the way I look at it and the way I explain it. Uh, is we're trying to increase our utilization of our assets. And you have three very fine golf courses, and this is held at Tenassi, uh, May 29th, on that rather large, extensive putting green. So I encourage you, if you don't have anything to do on that uh, afternoon, go out there and try that. It's a lot of fun. Financial update. We just got our results of our audit for 2018, and they were good. Uh, we got a, you know, you either get an A or an F in an audit. There is very little in between. Ours was an A, as it has been for the 26 years that I've been here. Uh, we received a clean, uh, unqualified opinion. Uh, the audit uh, team is from Coulter and Justice. That was presented yesterday at the board. It'll be on the website very shortly. Beth uh, said it'd be there today, but I'm going to say if you're that interested, check it Friday. It'll be there. Just to cover a little bit of the financial highlights, revenues were pretty much on budget. There's very little variance there. Uh, 31,000 given the whole scheme of the POA is not much to talk about. The expenses on the other hand are way under budget. And uh, I explained this to the board yesterday. I think a lot of that has to do with, I've got Mr. Gagley so tied up on these projects. He's not able to uh, spend money, which I need to figure out how to incorporate that. But this is made up of a lot of $50,000 projects, paint projects, sewer coatings, and so forth, and stuff like that that he just hasn't contracted out. And I'm sure that I will not be able to carry the whole entire uh, $800,000 to the bottom line, which would be a dream. But nonetheless, uh, I'd rather see it like this than I would see it inversed. On the capital aspect of our financial plan, we're doing good. We've uh, consumed about 82% of our budget. Now, naturally, the most of it is made up of the three large projects I just described earlier. Those are, are very large for us. And like I said early on, on our projects, uh, this is a very ambitious year for us. Uh, only since uh, probably the biggest year before this one would have been the Wellness Center uh, back in uh, seven. And uh, just want to update on marketing. This is the seventh year we've had the marketing program. Now, I know that the marketing team has given marketing reports, and they talk about statistics, and they, they give you all these numbers and so forth and so on. I'm going to give you my perspective on this. Uh, before we had a marketing program, we maybe sold uh, two, three, four POA lots. And these are, these are what I call dead lots. These were lots that, that they, didn't, they didn't sell. We had them turned back to us from people that, you know, they were... Uh, just reclaimed through, uh, you know, they made bad purchases, NRPI misrepresented themselves, etc. So we we're selling very little of these. Now that the marketing program has come along, 208 lots have been sold. And the way I look at that is this year, that 208 lots represents a inflow of $28,000 every month into the, the coffers of the POA. So that's one way to look at this thing, give you some perspective on that. Not to mention, in fact, since 2017, our property values have increased uh, 15%. Okay, the one last thing I want to cover before I introduce uh, Lowell is a political education committee. Uh, this is a, a board initiative this year that I think is very good. Uh, we have noticed in years, when I first started work here, 
the voting rate here was 90%, maybe even higher. This past election, it was 25, maybe. We've noticed a lot of apathy. You all have a lot of power in your vote, and we need you to exercise that. This committee is put together to educate all of you on what's going on in the local areas and governments and so forth. Uh, these are the members. We just had our first meeting today, and uh, I think that the board has assembled, uh, from what I saw today, they have assembled a very excellent group to take on this challenge. But their job is to study this and to educate the property owners on what's going on out there. And uh, please keep your ears pierced to this. Now, one of the most exciting things that I get to talk about today is uh, in regard to some legislation that just happened. So, Lowell, could you come forward? I'm going to let you take the lead on this because this is very exciting news. And I'm very appreciative on behalf of the POA for what you've done for us this year. Thank you, Lowell. Thank you. Thank you, Winston, and thank you all for allowing me a few minutes to come up here and talk to you all. A little update on what happened this year is we was all sworn in on Tuesday, January the 8th. We had 28 new House members, 20 which were Republican. It was the largest turnover since the 89th General Assembly, which was in 1975, 44 years ago. The governor was sworn in on Saturday, January the 19th. The current state budget for 2019-2020 physical year is $38.6 billion. My committee assignments are transportation. I'm the vice chairman of calendar and rules and uh, human resources. We had 1,543 bills that were filed in the House this year and 564 passed. That includes private acts and local bills. The four that I carried through the House my very first one was House Bill 838, and what it does is it uh, strength, strengthens the sex offender laws. Basically, if a person is on the sex offender registry and they go out and commit a new sex offense, they're uh, charged with a Class E felony, and for some reason, whenever uh, the initial law was put through the legislator, that was left out, so we was able to get that passed, and that was my very first one. House Bill 174 was my second bill to pass this season. And basically what that does is, is it moved the fire investigators for commerce and insurance to TBI and houses law enforcement that deals with arson investigations under one uh, umbrella instead of having them in two separate locations. So you don't have two different uh, fire investigators investigating the same fire. Now this bill right here is the one that Winston was talking about. It's House Bill 695, and this one I worked on all year for y'all because, and I'll tell you how this came about in just a second, but I worked on this one all year for you, and it's a exemption for your taxes for 501Cs for your POA, and it's for public safety equipment and public works equipment. And how that came about is, as I was over here campaigning, my very first election, and I was over at a little meet and greet, and uh, Mike Colicone told me, he said that y'all are paying taxes on things you buy related to public safety and public works, and I thought that was not very right, so I promised him then that I would try to do something about that. So I came over here to a, a little uh, debate here at this church, and I promised you there that I would try to get this done. I mailed out mailers and had uh, people sticking things in your mailbox, your paper box, and promise you I'd try to do it. And so when I got to Nashville, that was one of my top priorities. And we worked on it all season, and we got it passed the day before session ended. And basically what that does is, like I said, it uh, exempts you from your taxes, your, both your state and local taxes for public safety and public works equipment. And hopefully that'll keep the neighborhood safe and provide clean drinking water and things that you can use your money on to um, enhance that. The last bill that passed the House this year was House Bill 628, and that's the bill that I carried. And basically what that does is it makes adoptions easier and cheaper by dividing guardian ad litem fees between all parties except for the person being adopted. There was a guy down in Franklin, Tennessee that was sent an $11,000 adoption bill because of a guardian ad litem fee. So hopefully this will help out there. I co-sponsored 53 House bills, 
uh, co-sponsored 46 House resolutions and co-sponsored 14 Senate joint resolutions. That is just a little bit of a recap of what we've done this year. Now, every Friday while we're in session, I will send out a little letter, newsletter, and it'll keep you up to date if anybody's interested in that. If you'll call my office, I'll be glad to add your name to your email list and send that out to you every Friday and you keep up with what's going on in Nashville because there's a lot of things out there. And uh, if you don't keep up with it, sometimes you might miss out. Also, I'm on uh, Facebook, Lowell Russell State Representative 21. Throughout the week, if you want updates faster, that's a good way to get updates. But let me tell you, it's an honor to serve as your representative. I hope that if any one of y'all has a problem that I can help with, please give me a call or email me. I promise you this, I'll work hard for you, and I'll never take this job for granted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Russell. And uh, ditto what Winston said about the great things you're trying to help do for this village to make it a little more cost effective and let us spend money where we want to. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to Melissa Lindquist. She is the River Forecast Support Manager of TVA, and she's got some pretty fascinating things she's going to educate us about. Thank you, Jim. That one with no mark goes forward. Okay. 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 My name is Melissa Lindquist, and I am the River uh, Forecast Center Support Manager for TVA. And TVA is committed to providing affordable, clean energy, environmental stewardship, and economic development for across the valley. And the river management has been part of TVA's mission since TVA was written into law in 1933. And when TVA was first put into the TVA Act, we had mission to provide navigation down the Tennessee River, all 652 miles of it, also to provide for flood protection for the Tennessee River Valley, and to provide for power production. But as the years have gone on, we have increased our mission objectives. And so now in addition to navigation, flood protection, and power generation, we also look to provide for water supply for communities, recreation opportunities, and water quality. So this is a map of the TVA River Valley. And the green area, any water that falls on that area is eventually going to make it into the Tennessee uh, River Valley. That's a, about 41,000 square miles. And for some perspective, we have, uh, there's on, on the map circled is uh, Teleco and Fort Loudon. And so anything on the eastern side of that area is going to make it into Teleco and Fort Loudon. So the Tennessee River Valley is a very water-rich area. The Tennessee River is the fifth largest river system in the United States, and that's based on the amount of inflows that we get and the amount of discharge through the river valley. Um, we get on average about 51 inches of rainfall per year, and about 22 inches of that is runoff, which is water that makes it into the river. However, about 60% of that is going to be coming in the wintertime between January and April. So if you see on this plot, these green bars during the summertime, we get a lot less water that's making it into the river system. And as you might have noticed in February, we had a big rainfall event. And that's uh, when we're, we're going to be getting more of that water. And so that is exactly why we draw the reservoirs down in the wintertime. It's to provide greater flood protection for all of the people of the valley uh, during those higher probability um, of, of flood event months. So flood control is one of our primary missions, and to that end we have what we call flood damage centers that we are looking at that are across the valley that are uh, downstream of one of our, our dams. And so these areas we're looking at elevations and flows and communicating with local uh, constituents and EMAs and National Weather Service to provide them with information about where flood conditions currently are and, and what 
uh, they need to do to protect their local communities. So this is a picture of the downtown Chattanooga area from Lookout Mountain. And this is the flood of record from 1967. They had a 58-foot stage. And all of that white on that uh, picture is all water. And here is a picture of current day of the same uh, vantage point looking down onto the downtown metropolis of Chattanooga. So all of that area in that previous picture would have been completely covered up with floodwaters. And so part of what we're doing is trying to keep that from happening as much as we can. Um, so to that end, we use our deep storage tributary reservoirs, mostly up in the, the east, uh, eastern part of the valley, and we have them draw down to the winter pool elevations, and then we use that as storage to uh, store floodwaters until the downstream local flows have receded. And then we are able to bring those um, flows up to recover that flood storage after those flows have receded. And so we have averted approximately $280 million a year on average. However, February was maybe a little bit above that, and I'll get to that later. Um, but we also work with the Army Corps of Engineers to avert uh, flood damages on the lower Ohio and Mississippi rivers uh, for additional $17 million per, per year. Navigation is, is one of our primary missions as well, and to we, we have, um, at all nine of our main river projects, we have uh, navigation locks so that barges can, or private craft, can travel through the dams all the way down the, the 652 miles of the Tennessee River, and then up onto some of the tributary projects as well. And we have one tributary uh, lock at Melton Hill. Um, so navigation is a very cost-effective means of transportation. We are able to move, um, Lots of raw materials, grain, coal, oil, aggregates, and that's a saving about a billion dollars per year in shipping costs. Um, so, and we partner with the Army Corps of Engineers and with the U.S. Coast Guard in order to provide navigation services along the riverways. And it keeps a lot of semi-trucks off of the roadways, which I'm sure everybody appreciates. So, hydropower, um, TVA is a power producer and one of the assets in the portfolio is hydro. So we have 109 uh, hydro turbines at TVA and uh, have a combined capacity of about 3,500 megawatts. We also have a pump storage facility at Raccoon Mountain which has about 1,600, uh, 1600 megawatt capacity with four units. And what hydro is primarily used for is peaking power. So it's real easy to turn hydro units off and on and we can use them at the, the times when the load is the highest for, for the valley. And it, it provides a lot of flexibility to the people scheduling the power demand because all of that has to be met in real time because there isn't adequate storage capacity to produce power when it's not in demand. So it's, it's a big balancing act. And then water quality and supply, uh, we have over 700 water intakes that are permitted through TVA. And we work with local municipalities in order to make sure that they have their intakes at a low enough elevation so that the minimum flows that we're providing in those um, local rivers are going to be covered up around the year so that your communities can get clean, safe drinking water. And we are providing um, drinking water for over five million people throughout the valley. And we also are providing minimum flows to support industries and to provide for thermal cooling on the river for the nuclear and coal plants as well. And then water quality is a big concern as well for temperature purposes, but also for dissolved oxygen. If you don't have enough oxygen in the river system, you are going to get fish kills, and that's a very important part of our mission as well, is to make sure that we have healthy ecology in the river so that you, you don't have fish kills and everybody can get out there and enjoy the river and enjoy fishing. And we certainly get a lot of people interested about uh, fishing conditions, so it's a, a well-used <coughs> asset. Um, recreation, in addition to fishing, we also have, provide a lot of, of tailwater recreation in the form of whitewater rafting, like down at the Ocoee River um, 
areas, and we, we do provide a lot of um, areas where there's marinas and campgrounds, and uh, try to get our reservoir levels up by June 1st so that we are prepared for the big boating season. And this year, we, we have been up a, a bit early due to all the extra rainfall we've had. Um, but we, we try to encourage a lot of economic growth, and, and that partially is due to um, recreation uh, um, opportunities that we can provide in the region. So a lot of these objectives are conflicting, like if, if we want to provide more flood control, we want reservoirs down. If you want uh, navigation or recreation, you maybe want reservoir elevations to be up. And so we, we try to balance these as best we can. And what I like to say is, you know, if we're making everybody a little bit unhappy, maybe we're doing a good job. So to, in order to, to make these decisions, we have hundreds of gauges throughout the valley that are providing us hourly data about how much rainfall we've had, um, how, uh, what elevation and flow stream, streams are at, and then we have instantaneous data for all of our headwater and tailwater at all of our dams, as well as um, flow meters, and we put all of this data into hydrologic models that help us route the flows through the system and make the best decision that we can based on weather forecasts and, and what we are expecting to get in rainfall. So the River Forecast Center is where we're making all of those decisions and that's in downtown Knoxville and it is staffed 24-7, 365. So Christmas, uh, weekends, nights, holidays, we're, we're there every day. And you know, when you walk in on Christmas Day and there's 15 people in the room, you know it's a bad one. So, uh, I've had that one happen to me before. But we are issuing uh, two to four forecasts per day, and we are moving through all of that hourly data to make sure that it, it's uh, good, and then we are uh, using all of our modeling to provide the, the best forecast that, and schedule hourly schedules that we can. So back in February, we had a tremendous amount of rainfall. We actually broke a lot of rainfall records recently. So in 2018, we actually had the wettest year on record for the Tennessee River Valley. We had 67 inches of rainfall, which broke a record from 1973 of 65 inches. And if you recall, average for the uh, valley here is 51 inches. So we had a very wet 2018, and we walked right into a very wet uh, February. So this plot here shows normal rainfall and runoff accumulation for um, an average year, and then the blue and red lines up top are what we've actually seen through April. Um, so you can see there's a sharp uptick in February. And this is a, a, a rainfall accumulation map for February. So we had 11.6 inches on average of rainfall for the month of February. Normal rainfall, you're going to maybe have about four inches of rainfall. We had rain, I think, every day, but maybe six days of February. And um, up in East uh, Tennessee, you can see we had some purple up there. That's between 15 and 20 inches of rainfall. So it's a tremendous amount of rainfall, and it was all across the entire valley. And so this is a, a, our guide curve plot for Fort Loudon, and it's our headwater elevation. And Back in February, we used every, we, we had drove our elevation down to the bottom of our range in advance of the event, and then we used every last ounce of storage in order to prevent as much downstream flooding as we could and try to balance all of the, the reservoirs as, as we went along. And so during that event, we had a peak flow of about 98,800 CFS, which to give you some perspective, Niagara Falls has an average flow rate of about 85,000 CFS. So there was a, a tremendous amount of water traveling through uh, Fort Loudon Dam, and then that, those levels of flow just uh, accumulate the further you get downstream. I think Pickwick was up to about 500,000 CFS, so about five times what we had going out of Fort Loudon. Um, so Teleco, since we are connected between Teleco and Fort Loudon by a canal, their elevations pretty much mirror what you see at Fort Loudon. And at Teleco, um, we 
because of all this extra rainfall, are already at our summer pool target, which is usually by the 15th. Um, and we've been up there for a little bit, so you've had a few extra weeks of uh, high flows, or high, high river elevations, excuse me. Um, and the February flood event, obviously, was, was uh, during that, that high peak. So we didn't actually flow anything out of Teleco. Um, they, they aren't nor the gates aren't normally operated in a flood event. I think we've done that once before, and it was to allow us to keep the Fort Loudon lock open. But in this case, our flows out of Fort Loudon were so high, it wasn't going to give us any benefit. So we didn't actually operate the gates at, at Teleco during this event. So um, this is a plot for Chattanooga during the event. And the, the tan line that goes across the top that's about at 50 feet is uh, what we like to call is our, our naturals model. And that is the elevation that Chattanooga would have been at had we not done any uh, dam operations, if none of the dams had been in place. And we still got the same amount of rainfall across the valley. The red line below is the elevation that we actually operated the reservoir system to. So we knocked 20 feet off of Chattanooga's flood crest. And um, that picture I showed you earlier, the historic um, flood event was a, a stage of, of uh, 58 feet. So we were about eight feet shy of that, but downtown would have been completely gone <laughs> with that type of an event. Um, so a little closer to home uh, for Lenore City, we uh, reduced their flood crest elevation uh, by about 18 and a half feet. So overall, in February, we averted $1.6 billion of flood damages across the Tennessee River Valley, which is a huge amount more than our average flood reduction. So it was a very significant event. Um, so part of our flood management procedures include stakeholder outreach. We are making notifications all through an event like this directly to emergency management agencies, to the National Weather Service, to the navigation industries, to other constituents on the reservoir system, to areas where they have recreation interest, because we want to keep people safe and out of the, the water when flows are going to be as high as they are. And part of our outreach has, um, has grown into a lot of social media outreach, just to make this type of data as available to as many people as we can touch. And so we, we do a lot of posting on Facebook and on Twitter and do a lot of uh, news interviews. Um, I believe this one down at the bottom was actually with the Weather Service, uh, the, we the Weather Channel. And so we, we just have a, a big, uh, a growing social media footprint that we are, are just trying to expose as many people as we can to this information. And so we also post information on our, our TVA website and on our TVA app um, that you can get on your smartphone. But the, these are some pictures. So like after the rain is over, there are still flooding impacts. And we have, these are some pictures that are, are down in West Tennessee. And there were some communities that were completely devastated by the flooding event, but when you have as much rainfall as we had, you're still going to have some impacts no matter how, how prepared we are to move into that type of an event. So we are continuing our mission from 1933, and we have grown it to include navigation, uh, flood damage reduction, power production, water quality, water supply and recreation. And we are trying to balance all of those objectives to, to have the most benefit as we can for the most people as possible. And we try to make as much of that information as easily available as possible so that people can, can access information so that they know when to recreate and maybe when not to recreate. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. That was really informative. And I, for one, didn't know you were able to reduce the floodwaters by that much. That was pretty awesome. I'd like to now uh, introduce uh, Ken Lickey and Ken Van Swearinger, and they're going to finish our education on cybersecurity.
charge for this, by the way. Um, <clears throat> a big switch in topics now from uh, TVA and water to uh, cybersecurity. But I want to welcome everyone to our joint presentation by the Teleco Village Users Club and the Homeowners Association on cybersecurity. Now, cybersecurity is a very complex subject. And this presentation was developed over the last several months by Ken Van Swingen and myself. Uh, and as such, we will be sharing the stage tonight uh, on this important topic. You would get pretty bored if I was the only one talking here. Um, so as, it, as I just said, it's a very complicated subject, so we broke it over several meetings. Uh, our first meeting uh, was on March 14th, we called it Part 1, and it was Securing Your Personal Communications. And which provided an introduction into cybersecurity and suggestions on improving device and network security. Today, part two, we're going to discuss securing the things around you. Uh, we're going to talk about phishing. This is not phishing we do out in the lake, but this is, uh, this is phishing on the computer system trying to hook us, not, not fish. We'll talk about financial threats as well, uh, credit bureaus, financial sites, uh, credit cards, and then we'll end up with talking about uh, several different scams that are out there and how to avoid them. Uh, part three and four um, will be about protecting your home. And this will be done by the Neighborhood Watch. Uh, Mark Kovar is, is working on this project. Uh, it'll be in two parts. The first part will be on home security assessment tool. He's developing a tool that will be able to help you in developing priorities and action lists to make your home safer. And then he'll talk about home protection systems. Uh, he'll have a template to facilitate your quoting and implementation if you decide to do a uh, formal system. Now, there will be a survey coming, so be sure when you get it to complete it, it will help him tailor these presentations to our real needs here. So if you missed part one in March, no worries. The full presentation is on the HOA website, and some of the key material will be represented today. And today's presentation, as Ellen mentioned earlier, will be made available online. And we will have additional supporting information as well on, on the website. So if you missed something or want to review more in depth, you can do this later. So no need to take a lot of notes right now. So while uh, companies and institutions are constantly working to protect themselves, with increasing security measures, each of us must play a role in this fight as well. Your computer, tablet, cell phone contain information that hackers and other criminals would love to have. In a connected world, we each have a responsibility to protect ourselves and the people we interact with. And it all starts with understanding cybersecurity. Our presentations are designed hopefully not to scare anyone, but just to make people aware of the risks. And hopefully once you're aware of the risk and some ways to increase security, it will be easier to protect yourself. And as this is a very complicated subject, we want you to be aware that our presentation must be somewhat general in nature and cannot cover every threat that may exist in cyberspace but we feel this will provide you a good start in the education process. Now I'll turn it over, turn it over to, uh, to Ken. Thank you, Ken. Um, more than a couple of us might be like me who gets a birthday cake that's a raging forest fire. We've been, we were born, bef excuse me, before people really got into this whole thing of computing, I didn't even get into it until I was 41 years old. And I've heard a whole lot of people wondering why they've got to do things like passwords and go through all these problems. It's just so much trouble. Why do I have to do this? The younger people that have grown up with this kind of take it as, well, this is just what it is. So let's just look at this whole thing of cybersecurity, much like when we did something that was just 
what we did, we grew up with, which was driving a car. I mean, we just were going to go drive a car and have a good time. And we didn't think all that much about what we were going to have to do beyond that until we started driving. Then we found out there's a whole bunch of things out there that we have to do to be safe while we're driving. We have to make sure the car works, uh, the brakes, it's got gas, all these things. And so if you think about that, we just accepted that, much like the kids accept all the things of cybersecurity um, with computers. So that's why we've got this up here. There's a whole lot more that I'm sure anybody would uh, be able to add to this that's um, onto that list and think, well, we just do it. So please, let's just take the whole thing of cybersecurity kind of in that whole vein. Uh, because the digital world is just really the same. You just want to do things just like with a car. You just want to drive someplace. But in order to drive your car, you've got the safety. Well, here you need to be aware of those same type of security things, um, such as, like I say, uh, having a password. Think of it as like having to have a key for your car. Um, these are things that you just do. <coughs> So, one of the other things that we need to make sure people are aware of is um, just what cyber means. Cyber is just a term. Cyber is used for anything having to do that are computer cyborgs, are automated humans, robots, if you will. Um, cyberspace is just all of the digital information around you. Uh, cyber crime is the crime that happens, the phishing attacks, the malware attacks, the ransom attacks. These are all things that are cyber because they deal with the uh, digital world of computing. Um, how big is the cyber world? Well, the cyber world right now, there's uh, starting from 1989 was the first website. Uh, actually 91, a couple years later, the, the web was invented in 89, but uh, there's 1.2 billion websites, and that's growing every day. Data volumes are going to be 50 times greater in the next couple of years than they were in 2016. So the growth in just uh, between um, today and in four years there's going to be 50 times more data out there. I mean, they're just pumping all that data, so what's it all doing? Um, well, smart devices are using that to communicate wirelessly, and they're blowing up, although I did hear that uh, digital or the sales of phones are down a little bit. Apple wasn't real happy about that, but there are going to be 30 billion devices um, in 16, uh, from 16 to 20, the wear wearable device, excuse me, wearable devices such as uh, the wristwatches and things like that, that is a new exploding market. And so there's going to be about 500 million by 2020. So there's a lot of digital devices out there. We're going to need to protect 30 billion passwords globally in four, in, well, it's 19, so in one more year, we're going to have to be uh, 300 billion passwords are going to be uh, out there. Passwords, up by the way, and I'm going to cover passwords, passwords they're trying to get rid of. Microsoft is working so that they can get you safe, along with Apple, obviously, but they want to get it away from passwords to more of a, a biometric, facial recognition, and so on, so you don't have to remember all those passwords. But cars are also now getting more and more digital. Your phones are linking with them through Android Play, I, uh, the iPlay for Apple. So even your car is now getting wrapped into the digital world. Everything is. Okay, so how big is cybercrime? Um, huge, to put it mildly. 
here's a few statistics on it. Um, cyber criminals are now on the FBI's most wanted list. Identity theft impacts 60 million Americans. The U.S. government spends $15 billion on cybersecurity, which is, and they probably spent a lot more than that if it was fully, fully known. And the United States is the number one target for attacks around the world. And they estimate um, by, uh, it'll be a $6 trillion cost by the year 2021. So it's a, a huge, huge problem. So who's affected by this? We all are, obviously. Even if we don't use a computer or a smartphone ourselves, all our daily transactions are done and recorded in cyberspace. So who's out there targeting you? A number of different groups. Organized crime, criminal groups, hackers, malicious or not, they're trying to get into your computer. Amateur hackers, government-sponsored groups. So this is a face that's been kind of in the news uh, uh, lately, and a uh, quote from him, Robert Mueller, there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be, so everyone eventually. Okay, so as I mentioned a minute ago, passwords. You gotta think about passwords, we all hate them. Uh, I'd go over to people's homes during uh, first level support and people don't even want passwords. I don't wanna deal with it, it's too much trouble. Think of them like you would ha your car keys or your house keys. Those aren't trouble for you. Those are keeping your house and your cars protected. So think of passwords the same way. One of the most common passwords that we ever see out there is password or password one, two, three, four, something similar like that. And the password is just left there. Well, you wouldn't leave you know, any other valuable information just sitting around. You need to protect it. So how do you even know what a good password is? You've got to use really strong passwords. And we'll give you a couple examples on that. And you want to use real passwords, not fluffy or, you know, your, some simple thing, one, two, three, four. Um, and you want to keep them safe. Now, some people I've seen bring out little boxes with the recipe card index files on them and they've written the password down or they've scratched it on some paper or something. And then when they need it, they're running around, where is it, which one? Um, no, no, it's not this one. Oh, I, th I think it's this one, let's try this. You wouldn't do that with your keys or anything else. So you really wanna do find a way to keep them. The best way is a password keeper, password manager, uh, password, uh, protector, whatever you want to call them, that are programs that will log your login credentials and organize them. It's a whole lot easier for that thing to just save it. It will put it in alphabetically, and when a new one is created, it'll overwrite the old one. So you don't need to be going, which one of these cards is it? Additionally, you can have that password manager available on your smartphone, your tablet, and your computer. So any one of those devices that you create new login credentials, it automatically updates in the others. So you're not out in the car going, oh, what was that? Because I need that information about the bank so I can check something. But it's at home written on a, on a piece of paper. It's not doing you any good. So the password managers work much better. Biometric security is coming, and it is far better than a password manager. My phone, the only way you get into it is with a fingerprint. Now, I guess they can cut this one off, but I also registered two other fingers, so I'm not locked out. <laughs> but they're doing facial recognition, and, and iris uh, scanning is coming, so that you don't have to remember these passwords, and it's far more difficult to crack them than break into a software package that has your passwords or find that th file cards. 
Um, another thing that is coming and getting bigger and bigger, and we all dislike it, is now the dual authentication. You put in your password so the company knows it's you, but they want to make sure it really is you. So they will say, we're going to send you a verification text. So you not only have to have the password, you've got to have the phone that's associated with it. Some guy down in Brazil isn't going to have my phone to get that text message. So he can't verify. That's why they're doing it, not to make your life harder, but to keep you safer. It's getting more and more common. Okay. Um, you've got this one. Thank you. Okay. You hear the terms all the time about virus and malware. Well, exactly what are they? And simply put, a virus is a piece of software code that is capable of copying itself from computer to computer. Uh, malware, on the other hand, is a conjunction of the word, it's a conjunction of mal from the word malicious and where from the term software. Um, includes basically all the other bad things that can affect and harm your computer. Now, how do you get these things? You get them through downloads, emails, and bad links. On emails, you shouldn't open attachments without being careful. Just because it comes from a person you know, they could be sending it to virus to you unknowingly. And bad links. Watch for pop-ups that ask you to download or click on a link. Make sure they come from legitimate sources. So what's the best way to prevent catching these things? First, as I said earlier, be careful in what you open. Then make sure you have antivirus, anti-malware software, and anti-ransomware uh, software on, loaded on your computer. Um, ransomware is where someone actually locks your computer up and you, in return for asking for a ransom from you to pay them and they will unlock your computer. And we'll talk more about some of this later on. Uh, to keep these attacks at bay, once you've loaded the protective software, make sure you keep all the process, make sure you process all the updates as soon as you get them. If your system allows you to do this, have these processed automatically for you. Okay, as mentioned a minute ago, uh, phishing. And phishing, it's just a term because it's similar to trying to catch fish. They're just trying to catch you. And so they've come up with this term called phishing. And one of the things that is an, a phishing attack but might seem like ransomware, if you get your computer screaming at you, the light, the screen's flashing and it is screaming and it's telling you that it's gonna self-destruct and you've gotta call this number right away or this is gonna happen. They're counting on that fear to get your, to put down your reasonable guard enough to call, and when you do, they will get you. But it really is only a cookie. Turn off your machine. Don't just do a restart. Turn it off, let it sit for about 20, 30 seconds, and then restart it, and guess what? That screaming screen is gone. But they are, it's a phishing attack. They're trying to get you to do something that you wouldn't normally do, which is just lose your sense and go and call and give me your credit card number, and they've got you. But it really is not a, a ransom attack. A ransom attack, it, your computer will be locked. You'll get 72 hours or something to come up with 500 bucks. So what is phishing? It's, the goal is to trick, and it can be an email, and most likely is going to be an email. Um, and the, the goal of that is to get you to follow that email and give up information. Again, it will come as some kind of a, of a warning that you, you've been hacked and you've got to respond with and verify all of your data. Click on this link and tell us all about yourself. Well, if it's your bank, they already have that information. They're not going to ask you for it. That's the biggest giveaway is they want the information. You always go. So if you get something, you think it might be from your bank, 
just go and contact your bank and say, hey, did you send this out? And so that's where they're going to work and, and run around as trusted. It's going to be your bank or somebody else that you know. Cell phones, they'll do the same thing. A cell phone is a computer. Make no mistake about it. It's just smaller. All right, so how are the ways that they're going to try to get to you? They're going to look for information and doing things such as do you frequently enter online contests? You're putting information out there about your email address and saying, hey, I'm here. I want to, you know, win this contest. Well, they know then that you are somebody who can be hooked. And so they can look for people that do that and get the information from those forms you fill out. The same thing with warranty cards. Most companies, your warranty is fine. You don't have to send those cards in. They want information to, for marketing, but that information can also be used then as you are somebody that has money to spend. So you're a good target. You fill out lots of surveys. Again, you're giving out information on things you like to do, things that you own. You know, you own a house, how big is it? You own a car, you own motorcycles, boats, whatever. The other place that they go looking for information is Facebook. Um, people love to post on there, we're out to dinner, we're leaving on a cruise for six months tomorrow morning at 7.08. Leave your front door open, because <laughs> they know you're not going to be there. So why, why do that? Wait till after you get back and say, hey, we had a great trip. So be very aware of that. One of the prime places for getting information, as Ken mentioned, the U.S. Just because you're a U.S. citizen makes you a big target because you've probably got more than anybody else in the world, so why not go for you? A lot of people toss mail without shredding it. You'd be surprised at how much information can be gotten. People are not, people that are looking to make an easy living, they don't mind digging through some garbage. They can find out things that you got. You get offers for credit cards you, or whatever, shred them because they know that you are somebody who is likely to be able to have the means, the money that they want. Sadly, uh, I was kind of surprised when I read this, obituaries. There's a lot of information about you guys out there, and these are used as security questions, such as where you lived in such and such a year, um, cars you've owned, all of these things. They get names, they get other types of data, such as cars and where you lived and things for security. So obituaries become another place for them to get information that could be used for answering security questions. So you do want to honor people, but you know you do want to think about just what you might be putting out there. <laughs> okay. Um, this is typical of, or not typical, but this is representative of what you might get. And if you look up at the top, it's sent uh, from Amazon Management at mazoncanada.ca. Uh, we don't generally read these things when we see them. All we see is Amazon.com, so we think it's something from Amazon. Dear client, well, that's pretty generic. Why don't they know you? Amazon is certainly capable of knowing all this, who they're sending it to. And then also, they will be asking, again, as I mentioned, for you to confirm all sorts of identity things. So you would then be providing them with these security question answers. Here's one from Wells Fargo. And again, um, it's from Wells Fargo. But you can see after Wells Fargo, no reply at wfar.com. And so here they've sent something saying the account's temporarily limited. What they want you to do is click on that, sign on to the Wells Fargo account, 
I'll guarantee that's not Wells Fargo. So if you saw something like this from whoever, just simply go and call Wells Fargo. Did you send this? I got it. What they will ask you to do is forward that email to their fraud department. Now here's an example a little closer to home, right here in Teleco Village, the HOA. This happened this year. Uh, if you look at this, and I'll read it to you, it's a little hard to read, but it's from Ellen Fox, president of the HOA, in theory, <laughs> uh, to our treasurer, Linda Klein. And uh, hi, Linda, how are you doing? Please, I need you to set up a bank transfer of $5,620 for a payment today. Let me know if you can handle this right away so I can send you the bank info. Thanks, Ellen. Okay. It, uh, it looks pretty legit, right? Well, thank goodness uh, Linda Klein is very sharp and uh, questioned this. But uh, Ellen's email, that's not really her email. They took, Ellen actually has an a initial in her, uh, in her email address. But other than that, it looked legit. So she questioned it and uh, obviously did not pay it. But here's a, a perfect example close to home. What to do about phishing? Uh, first thing is never follow an email link or a phone call or a text. Be careful. At first glance, it may look like someone you know, but it may not be. Um, never reply to the request. Go to the person, website, or customer service and verify the validity of any request or information. And regarding robocalls, you can add your phone number to, to the do not call registry or other service. And I'm sorry to say hope for the best because I know we've added ours, but we still get call, robocalls all the time and I'm sure you're all like me. Uh, and uh, if you get one blocked, then they try different tactics to get a hold of you in different ways. And the latest scheme uh, on robocalling is uh, they call late at night when you're at least aware, awake and aware of what's going on. Only ring one time. And then you look at it quickly and, and, and it looks familiar. So you hit call back and it's another country and all of a sudden you have a huge charge to you. So that's something to watch out for. What do you do if you suspect cr criminal activity? It's recommended that you contact the police. And in this uh, example we, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago in the HOA, we did contact the Loudoun County Sheriff's Office, and they were able, able to track it back to the originating bank where the money was to be transferred to, and they're still uh, working on this. And even if they can't really do much about it, the police will make note of this crime, and it will help to determine the scale of these attacks and help other law enforcement agencies deal with it. Let's talk about financial matters now. And this is where the dark web thrives. And you've likely heard the term dark web before, and it sounds really scary, and it really is. Uh, targets of the dark web include banking, credit and debit cards, credit monitoring, social security, and ID theft. Okay, um, yeah, the reason they call it a dark web is because it lives in a very dark place of the world, kind of like the bottom of the ocean. And so there's three general parts of surfing uh, the internet. One is the surface, which is where we all do our emails and all the types of things that we would do, communicating back and forth with kids, sharing photos, Facebook, and all those types of things. This is what we do. The deep web is a secondary part of the internet, and this is where all the commerce happens. This is where the social security uses to transmit the funds to your bank to be deposited. This is where medical records are transferred. These are all types of things that we generally will never deal with, and so it takes very special software, and you have to know very different ways of addressing this to even get into it. So we don't even know it's there, just like the waters below uh, the surface. And that's where, like I say, government, academic, and so on goes. But there's a, a deeper part. It's kind of the Marianas Trench, and that is the dark web. You 
actually can buy the software to get to the dark web, but the dark web, you think of it as kind of a bazaar where there's little kiosks set up by people that want to do nothing that is good. This is where people want to set up things to uh, sell guns, hire hitmen, sell kids, drugs, you name it. If it's really a, a nasty thing, there are people on the deep web doing it. Now, some of those guys turn around and start working to help out. And a couple were interviewed. And I actually got this from AARP. And it's a really good definition of the parts of the web. But the thing that I found interesting, they were talking to these two guys that were reformed. And what they do is assemble all those security questions. They'll, they'll get your credit information from the credit card or the credit bureaus. They'll get your social security number. They'll get all of these things and they'll build a bundle, which is you. And then they sell that. Well, somebody decided to go out of business and so he had a fire sale on his packages of IDs and he was selling them for $2.95. So somebody can buy your life and absolutely destroy you for $2.95. This is why we want people to really be aware. You've got to take this to heart that you have to protect yourself because that's all you are. You're just nothing to people. So part of staying uh, secure is HTTPS. Normally on a web address, it's HTTP, but the HTTPS stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. And what that secure does is there's a couple ways of identifying it. One, uh, in the URL, as it's called, you'll see a change from HTTP to HTTPS and there will be a little padlock, but that tells you that what has now happened is there is a tunnel, a secure link between you and your bank. And so the information that you transfer to your bank to transfer funds on using your phone or whatever, that is secured. It virtually locks out. I'm, sh I'm sure some hacker putting enough effort can get in, but most will just see and not bother. So you always want to look and make sure anytime you're dealing with anything that has sensitive information, that what you see is HTTPS. And think of that as your security um, as you're surfing. Now, as I mentioned, along with H seeing HTTPS, there's a little lock. If it's only HTTP, the lock will be open. So look for those two things when you're uh, working on the web, anytime you're doing more than just email. Okay. So how do you uh, check your, uh, uh, make your bank accounts uh, more secure? Um, I would suggest checking your bank account balances on a regular basis. Uh, and then if your banks allow it, enable alerts. Credit cards and debit cards, the same. Set up alert monitoring on texts or phone calls. And it's a good idea always when you're going out of the country to alert your credit card company when you're traveling. And you certainly don't want to be in a foreign country and all of a sudden your credit card company declines your charges. So uh, always do that, it's a good idea. Okay, um, one of the things that is coming along, along with uh, your using your credit card to purchase everything, now you can use your phone. And a lot of people are, are very concerned, well, I don't want to do that because it's not secure. Here's the way the web, the web works. You have on a macro scale, you have your, uh, your cell service. You can go miles and miles and be communicating back and forth. You shrink that down, you get to your Wi-Fi. Your Wi-Fi is a much more limited access. You might see your neighbors or something, but that's about all the farther it's going to get as far as getting information to and from you. You drop down another level, Bluetooth, 
transmission range about 30 feet. Might be a little more, but that's generally the number. So a new thing has come up to enable phones to work very securely for it. It's not much different than putting your credit card in one of the machines because there's a protocol called uh, near transfer or near field communication. And that keeps that link where it had gone all the way out. Now you're down to only about a, an inch or two. If your phone is much farther than an inch away, it won't work. That's why you touch and so on. So when you use your phone, what happens is there's, it's the same as putting your credit card in. It, you can't get somebody to sneak in and steal the, that data that's being transferred. Additionally, what will happen is a lot of the credit cards and services will send a dummy number. They know what your number is, but they use a bogus number and a bogus um, CCV, and this is to keep you safe. And so Samsung does it one way. Apple is coming out with a credit card that will work on their phone. We're running out of time. <clears throat> right. Oops. Um, with the growing importance of uh, Teleco Life uh, for activity signups and for mem membership signups using credit cards, let's spend a few minutes talking about um, any concerns uh, that may exist about security on Teleco Life. Uh, I won't read all this, but. Uh, First, Teleco Life is licensed from MemberClicks, whose software is used by over 1,900 clients uh, for 20 plus years. And Teleco Life is hosted uh, on an Amazon company, uh, AWS. You've probably seen commercials on TV for this. It's a world's leading company and provides the various latest technology, security, and performance. And all software and hardware is in, in a secure data center with excellent physical and um, uh, software security as well. Regarding your privacy on Teleco Life, your profile is not available to the public. Other Teleco Life users can only see your name and pictures if you allow it. Only the clubs, organizations you choose to belong to can use your Teleco Life email. No email blasts to all Teleco Life registered users. Access is limited to those who would need to know and have to sign a confidentiality agreement as well. When you pay with a credit card, it's never stored on Teleco Life. It's sent encrypted to Payscape, a leading credit card company processor. Both member clicks and Payscape maintain the highest level, standard level security in the industry. Bottom line, the usage of Teleco Life and processing payments by credit card is as safe as possible. Okay. Okay. Um, running very short on time, so I'm going to get through this as quick as I can. Credit bureaus. Um, there are the three credit bureaus, and there is a lot of information there about you, but this is also where credit is given. It's, uh, companies access the credit bureaus to make sure that you're a safe bet and then give you an account. Um, there's 143 million consumers, Equifax thinks, are going to have their files breached. And so you've got to make sure that you keep that safe. And so how do you do that? There's a couple of things you can do. You can freeze and you can lock your accounts, both of which prevent people from getting things, but they have different levels of protection. The, most, the highest level is freeze. That is their state statutes that govern how that is done. So you want to make sure to freeze your account. That means nobody is getting an account. You have to unfreeze so that somebody can even check your credit if you're looking for um, buying a car or a boat or something. But by freezing your account, that also means nobody else is going to be able to open an account in your name. And you, it's easy enough to do. It took me about 15 minutes to do all three of them. The thing that I do need to tell you is you want to keep the the pins, the codes for those, in a very secure place so that when you go want to unfreeze it to purchase a car, to purchase a home, to purchase whatever that is going to need a credit check, 
you can unfreeze that account, tell it to stay unfrozen for two days, and then automatically refreeze, and it, you're good to go. I've done it from my phone. It is not a big deal to do. But you also want to make sure that you check your credit um, at, at least once a year. You can do so. That's a soft pull. It will not affect your credit rating. Okay, we'll briefly talk about some other popular scans. And, and probably most of you have heard about the Nigerian Prince scam. Uh, I think it's kind of funny here. Nigerian Prince needs $100,000. Where's my checkbook? Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about uh, first one, IRS tax scams. Uh, perennial favorite for, uh, for criminals. Uh, been used for decades. Uh, remember, if someone claims, calls you and claims to be from the IRS, uh, they don't normally initiate any contract on contacts with you by phone, email, or text. Uh, most contacts are initiated through regular mail delivered by the, uh, by the, uh, by the mail post office. Um, move on here a little bit. Uh, they will not ever demand immediate payment. Uh, they'll first email you, a, uh, mail you a bill, not email, mail you a bill. Uh, and uh, so again, if any questions you have on this, issues with it, best thing to do is call the IRS directly and uh, make sure that it's a valid, uh, make sure it's valid. Uh, Social Security scams, this is growing substantially. Uh, it's surging in, in the United States. Um, they're using robocalls, and, and uh, if you're like me, I've received many of these calls already uh, this, in the last few months about something wrong with my Social Security. I had to call immediately and get it corrected. Well, those are not real. Um, just like the uh, IRS scam, um, they will never contact you directly out of the blue and look for money on a gift card or anything like that. Um, any questions you know, about something like that, again, call them directly. Medicare scams, we've all should have received uh, your new Medicare card, which doesn't have your social security number on it, which is a great, a great uh, change they made. Again, if somebody's calling you asking for money or anything to do with this, call them. It's probably uh, not, uh, not real, it's a scam. So in conclusion, you need you to help keep you safe. Guard your personal information, use strong passwords or password keepers, Ken talked about. Be careful online. Be cautious of posting information on social media. Don't tell everybody your whole life out there. Be careful when info was requested of you Others are trying to get you to give them information and follow safe computer use methods, up-to-date software, keep it up-to-date. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, all this information will be available online on the HOA website under the general meetings. And lastly, there are, uh, there are other resources out there to learn more about uh, computers in general or, uh, or, or cybersecurity. Uh, join the Tele Teleco Village Computer Users Club. Uh, the uh, University, Teleco Village University has a lot of information, and uh, as well as Neighborhood Watch. Okay. If I might make one last point. When you get these robocalls, don't answer them. Don't hang up on them. Your hanging up tells whoever that is a live number. Somebody is actually there. Just let it ring. Same thing with emails. If you didn't ask for it and so on, don't reply. Just opening it up triggers that they hit a live address. So you want to make sure, just ignore all the stuff that you aren't expecting. Okay. Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, ask Keith Sanderson to come up and he'll be talking about the Monroe County Friends of Animals. <clears throat> Well, it's a good thing some of you are leaving because I have to recount something that happened 50 years ago. And I was taking a public speaking course in college, and when I finished, the professor said to me, she said, Keith, never, never speak in public again. 
So this is the first time in 50 years I've done that. And, and I feel compelled to because I feel so strongly about Monroe County Friends of Animals. Now why do I do that? I live in Loudoun County. Why shouldn't I be helping them? And I could be, but I thought their story was so compelling. The work that's been done and the work that needs to be done. And so I'd like to share some of that with you and some progress on where we're going as far as potentially building a new animal shelter. My speech teacher didn't teach me how to work this thing either. So, which is it? It's that one. It's this one right here. That one. Okay. Okay, what are we? A lot of people get us confused with the animal shelter. It's a fact, some people even think of us as the animal shelter, and when you see the animal shelter, you yell at us. Well, we're not. We're a partnership. And we're a partnership with uh, the Monroe County. They provide, they're responsible for the shelter and the staff to operate it. And, my, and we're uh, an independent, nonprofit organization that helps care and improve the lives and length of lives of homeless and abandoned cats and dogs in Monroe County. Now, why should anyone care? They're cats and dogs, right? Anybody out there own a cat or dog? I bet you every one of you could tell me why you should care. Am I correct? Because those, those little guys really mean a lot to a lot of people. And sometimes they get lost. And that's one reason we should care about it. Your dog or cat gets lost. It doesn't know borders. It doesn't know Monroe County from Loudoun County, from Knox County, and it could end up anywhere. One time, I had a little dog, and my parents and I, we went on vacation, and Friends watch that dog, they live 25 miles away from us. And that dog got loose. And I cried, and I cried. And why did I cry? Because my buddy was gone. And then one day I looked out the window, and there was this emaciated little dog. And I yelled to my father, I said, hey, Mitzi's home. And he said, can't be. And we went out, and it was her. She somehow found her way 25 miles. So dogs don't know borders. They can travel, and, be, and cats also, a great distance. So when we're near somewhere, it could ha be our dog or cat that gets picked up somewhere else. Now, a brief history. We're not part of the county. We're an independent organization. We were founded in 2004. You know what Monroe County, and I don't mean to knock them, uh, but you know what they had a distinction for at one time? being one of the highest areas of euthanasia in the United States. The South really had a, uh, not a good reputation in, in Monroe County. And there were some citizens who, and many of them from um, Teleco Village, who said, hey, this can't be. And so they set about to change things. And it really is proof of what a few determined people can do. They consulted with the county and said, hey, we need a shelter. And the shelter agreed. They passed it by one vote of the, that, uh, to have a county shelter. And that's how the county shelter started in Monroe County. And we worked in partnership to help make sure the animals are treated right. Now, what do we do? Each year, uh, we provide 33 to 40 percent of the operating costs of the county. The county provides the other, you know, 60, 70 percent. So we're always busy raising funds, as are many volunteer organizations. But the thing is, if you take a look at that, uh, we're paying for 30 to 40 percent of a county institution, and we're just out there working our little hearts out trying to raise some money to do that. And what might you get out of that? Your money, anybody who wants to donate to us. And by the way, anybody who went to the uh, Whiskers, Wags, and Wine event the other night over at the Yacht Club for us. I want to thank you uh, because you really did a great job. And how have we done? We've saved an estimated over 25,000 cats since uh, founding in Monroe County Friends of Animals in 2005. Look at those guys. Think my, what ha might happen to them. And the important thing to remember, it's just not dog, about dogs and cats. It's about people.
Because if for every one of those animals saved, there was probably a human being or family whose life was changed for the better. How many of us enjoy it when our cat or dog, when we come home, is there at the door wagging their tail or meowing? That's our friend. How many have adopted a dog or cat? A pretty big bunch of you. How many from uh, Monroe County? Thank you. Thank you very much. But how many of you ha are happy because you adopted them? There you go. The current challenge, that's the shelter, that fine looking building. It's leased. So if it doesn't fall down, that lease, the property might get sold. And then what are we going to do? That's the dream, a new up-to-date shelter. It's maybe a little more than a dream. We've, built, we've purchased the building site, five-acre site in the industrial park. We've established a building fund, preliminary designs uh, for a shelter. $425 a square foot is the estimated cost. About what it costs to build a hospital per square foot. Pretty expensive. And why? Think about it. What does a ho hospital have? High transient population with disease. What does a shelter have? High transient population with perhaps disease. So you got to take care of that. Now, where we're at now, and the one reason I'm here is, yeah, to raise money, but also to raise recognition because we're in negotiations with the county. And we need your support and to follow us and to help us, not only with donations and volunteering, but you know, to voice your opinion about whether or not animals should be treated humanely. So what do we need for the dream? Donations, of course. Uh, if you'd like, you can uh, leave a donation at, out front at the table or sign up to be on our mailing list to get more information. And uh, we'd love to have you. Or volunteers, and not necessarily volunteers for the shelter, but volunteers for administration, for communication, for bookkeeping. If, the basic skills any business or organization has because we have no paid administration. You can find us on www.monroecountyfriendsofanimals.org. You can make a donation there also. And if you want to be a volunteer, have a question about the future, see Walt Marshall or Jim Barrett or me out front after the meeting. Thank you. So we've got a little bit of time left, thank you very much, Keith, uh, for some Q&A. Can we invite maybe Winston and Melissa to come join us up here? It'll just make the logistics easier if there's a lot of Q&A. Thank you. Uh, if you've got a question, those charming ladies in the back are walking right towards you, so they'll bring a mic to you and then if you could answer it. Thanks, Ken. A uh, question for Melissa. Uh, given the record rainfall in 2018 and record rainfall in February of this year, is the, is the TVA kind of futuristically looking at what might be the new normal for rainfall and what that means to the waterways and the dams? We do look at weather forecasts, long-term weather forecasts, long-term weather trends, and then short-term weather forecasts. And we, we utilize the short-term weather forecasts on a daily basis in our hydrologic routing, which is what helps us to prepare for events like what we saw in February. Um, but the averages that we see for the, the average rainfall and runoff throughout the year, that is a compiled average based on the last uh, basically on our, our record that we have throughout history. So we are uh, keeping up to date with kind of the trends as they come in, but each, each year 
like just because we had record rainfall last year doesn't mean we're going to have record rainfall this, well, we already have. Um, but if, if we haven't, it <laughs> doesn't mean like next year is going to be record. So we, we kind of keep looking at the trends and it, it's a kind of a constant updating process. Uh, I have a question regarding the cable television offering in the village. I believe that it's extremely archaic compared to what's available in the outside world. And I'm wondering what the OAs can do to work with the developer to pressure Charter Spectrum into doing something about improving the cable television offering. I'm talking about the, the sets that we have in our homes and that kind of thing. Um, it, it, it's just very frustrating to use that stuff. Well, I'm not sure I can answer that question. I think Ellen probably has the answer for that. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about uh, that. Uh, I've, I've not had anybody approach me with an issue with that. Not to say that you're absolutely correct, but um, I haven't been working in this area. Uh, I can talk to our IT department, which I know has uh, had difficulty with the very same subjects because of our communication system. So I'm not sure what to tell you there, but I would encourage everyone with that feeling to give them a call and see what what they could do and upgrade and so forth. Um, question for uh, Winston. Um, on uh, Thinking about the legislation that Lowell Russell was talking about, what kinds of savings on construction equipment does that represent for the POA? The 25,000 limit would be approximately 375 or $77,000 worth of equipment would be tax exempt in a year. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Blazer. I've been here since October and I understand the wellness center was built in 07. How many roofs have been put on that? I've heard varying numbers. Well, they've had difficulty with the roof, but th this is the original roof that they're repl or repairing. Now, they've, they've done some testing on the roof that was in conjunction with the natatorium work. So you might have seen some people up there uh, removing and testing the, the uh, underlayment that that's, was in there for uh, humidity issues. They have had some patching problems over on the on the workout side or the uh, exercise rooms roof, where they tracked down a very deceptive leak. Uh, but this is the, the original roof that'll be repaired. Okay. Anybody else? Sure. One more. Yep. Thanks, Linda. Go. Oh. Okay. Can you hear me? Fine. I would like uh, Winston perhaps to comment a bit more on the reserve fund, and I'm particularly interested in knowing if there is a formal reserve study that's part of this or has been done. I like to hear that when you said it was going to be extended to out to say 50 years, are all of the things on the reserve list intended to be things that are unavoidable, known? and in the future so that if the reserve fund is adequate, when you reach that point, you just have to figure out who the contractor should be and what you have to buy. It's not a rainy day fund. I, I'm interested in knowing if that's the way you see it. Yeah, the, the um, reserves have always been in place. There's various reserves like repair and maintenance reserve, dock reserves, uh, amenity reserves which are being employed right now as we speak. Uh, they're, they're set up, there's anywhere from three to five million dollars set up in these various reserves. They are set up for contingencies like uh, road work, uh, repair work, uh, uh, things of that nature, r major roof repair, etc. So they are set up that. When you say formal reserve study, I'd, I'd like to address that issue from the standpoint. Every year, uh, we go through a budget cycle, budget process, and that is just one of the areas that is thoroughly dissected. 
Uh, we look at our balances. We look at where we are going and what we're going to need for the next year and then five more years on top of that. And money is uh, appropriated and, and allocated and, and percentages of assessment are adjusted to cover that very aspect on that. Now, there's some people that, that uh, come from other associations that do a more uh, formal study. And when I say more formal, it's a, it's a required by their state and something like that. I don't think they're near as good as the process we go through now. Ours is more specific and more detailed, and it's not as cookie-cutter approached. And I like what we do now, and I'm very pleased with that. I have a, oh, I have a question for Melissa, or two questions, actually. What kind of a degree do you, do you have? Is it in the water management type field? And the second question is, um, is there any problem with zebra mussels in the, in the TVA Valley? Um, my degree is in, uh, I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in environmental engineering. And so all of the forecasters are gonna have a degree in some form of engineering. Um, and then zebra mussels, there are some mussel buildup areas, usually more around like the nuclear plants where there's some warm water coming into the river. Um, but I don't know specifically um, too much about what kind of populations or, or what kind of problem, level of problems we have with that. But I, I know that we have done some remediation work to, to try to, to remove some of the mussels, but I, I don't know any specifics on that. Whenever you're doing projections, you have to make some assumptions in terms of what kind of assumptions did you make in terms of like population growth and some of those things. Could you educate us on some of those? Um, excuse me, sir, can you just repeat that, please? Whenever you make projections, you got to make some assumptions. What's the population going to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years? And what were some of the assumptions that you made to come up with much reserves and whatever else you're going to be doing. Oh yeah, when when uh, for example, I'll I just give you an example on uh, the amenity reserve. What they'll take a look at is is renovations to our buildings or new facilities that are coming, and they will have a time period that that's going to hit, and then they will you know ramp up to that point, and it's like uh, you know the piggy bank. You build up to it, you get to the point to buy the baseball mitt, you spend it, it comes down. So yeah, there's assumptions made and, and they, they ramp up. And they, RAR, RAR, uh, repair and maintenance is based on experience, age of buildings, life of air conditioners, age of roofs, and so forth and so on. Well, on the population consideration, those aren't, I mean, we, we look at utilization for like amenities and we look at, you know, I guess the best answer to give you on that is, is I mentioned the studies that were coming and at the tail end of my comment, I also mentioned that one of the uh, factors that's gonna be looked at is the long range plan. The long range planning group is looking at and doing a very thorough study of, of where we should be headed and what's going on. And population is just one of the many elements they're looking at. And that will all be baked in along with the road, the sewer, the, the reserve study, all that's going to be baked into the financial picture for 2020 and the, and the out years. So there's a lot of, lot of different assumptions. It's, and I would encourage you to fill out a uh, long-range planning app or possibly an FAC application on serving on that committee because we like the analysis type people in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unless somebody else has a burning question, I just want to thank our speakers, presenters, and also thank all the HOA volunteers that make this work. And thank you for coming and listening to us. Thank you.